Hello, Stuart St Paul here. Just leaving Hamburg and this amazing blue light festival which they do once in a blue moon, funnily enough. But if you want some excitement, well, you've actually found it because you've come here to listen to Cruise Ship Heist. If you've not started from the very beginning, here's the link to go back to episode one. And if you've been listening, carry on enjoying. Chapter 11. Orders. The ship has three stairwells. Midships is in the middle. The top lift button seems logical for the top bar. Not rocket science, but ship science. It's past six o'clock, which is the witching hour for dress code rules. But no one else is wearing a jacket, so I feel self-conscious. At the top, I look out of the window at the white water washing behind us in the red evening glow. The other two are not in the bar as agreed at lifeboat drill. I order a beer and relax on a bar stool, pulling out the note left in my cabin. Hey, Dad, I'm rehearsing all afternoon. Two shows tonight. Please watch the last one. See you after. Love you. I'll see both shows, I tell myself. My proud smile is broken by Georgie's arrival next to me, handing her cruise card to the barman and ordering a drink. Let me. I offer my card, but she shakes her head. We don't do rounds. We're all in the same ship. Even if you can afford it, how much did you get? Nothing. Wasn't expecting anything. I was smiling at Dad. It's such a great word. I show her the note. Take the load off, I suggest, moving away from the bar to a table and pulling a chair out for her. This is not a bar where I'm supposed to sit down with passengers. I'll stand, she says, handing the note back to me. You can sit. Your guest staff. Best of both worlds. So, is Aluli actually your daughter? It's complicated. She calls me dad. That's more than enough for me. The tale needs more time than she may wish to spare. Ronnie arrives and places a beautifully wrapped parcel in front of me. You shouldn't have gone to so much trouble. I didn't. I had them do it in the gift shop, Ronnie jokes. It's your new pension. I turn the sizable brown paper block that gives nothing away but I know what it is. Ronnie orders a beer at the bar. Mine was delivered along with my empty handbag, Georgie says, weighed down by the whole thing. Didn't know your cabin, Phillips, Ronnie says, taking her glass from the bar and raising it as she joins us. I raise my glass to a toast, computing the progression of the situation. Is it as much as the young engineer got? Georgie asks. My army poker face is getting tested. Who is this fourth person? Did one of the painters get in on the deal? Has the money been cut into four? The money is not my concern. I never wanted it. But does a fourth person know about the heist even before the sun has fully dropped? I place Aulie's note on the brick. She had nothing a few years ago. I had some savings and an asset until I put my house up to pay for her safety and sanity but many of her friends still live in a war zone. Maybe this money could be put to benefit them. I never counted it, just made equal stacks assuming they're all the same notes. It's enough not to ask or argue, Ronnie states. Who's the engineer, I ask. Georgie looks sombre. The guilt is laying heavy on her. She needs to shake herself out of the dark mood. She was saved from a large error in her judgment unless she knew Ronnie was on her flight and that she'd solved the problem. He was a whistleblower, Ronnie says. Now I'm even more intrigued. My frown requests her to expand. Maybe that's what George is worried about, us being turned in. A trainee on another ship saw a discharge of illegal sludge and couldn't live with it. He turned whistleblower and the shipping company was fined $40 million. He got the first million. Ronnie explains. Wow, I exhale at the story that has obviously become a legend. Ronnie toasts me. He did the right thing. Who'll turn us in? Georgie fires curtly. No one. We never talk about this, Ronnie answers. What if someone wants it back? What if they saw me take it? She was arrested. The money was confiscated. The guards will have had their share. What if it was a drug enforcement operation, I ask. The guards at customs were expecting her. 
They weren't expecting us, and I checked the wad for simple markings, Ronnie says. The ship has left the country. I want to open the package and find a razor blade to scratch across the surface and see if any dust comes off. If microchips had been added to the print, they come off by shaving them. I was often asked to carry money for the government and pay off warlords. Only once did I lighten the payment, carefully shaving every note. I felt I'd earned every last pound by the time I'd finished. Once was enough, and it was needed to get orphaned children out of Syria to Turkey. Ali was one of them, the only one I really saved, the only one that calls me dad, and she's about to perform on stage and expects me to be watching. What happened to the officer who released the sludge into the sea? I asked Ronnie, my mind jumping back to reality. Rumour is he's on permanent gardening leave. He won't work again, Ronnie answers. Did the company ask him to dump the waste, I probe? No, never. But Ronnie's holding back. Then why do it? Must have felt that he needed to hit targets he couldn't meet any other way. It was stupid. This isn't stupid, Commander. It's not marked. It's no one's money, Ronnie says. Do you think it's drug money? Georgie asks quietly. Drugs leave South America, hundreds of tons each month. Money goes the other way, in. So maybe, but maybe not, Ronnie muses. Was she stealing it, trying to escape with it, I speculate. If she was, they'll make an example of her, Ronnie says. God rest her. I find myself toasting with Ronnie as if we'd lost a soldier. I neck my drink like a squaddy. Ronnie slides the package to me. It's just the right size for your room safe, Ronnie smiles. My daughter's on stage soon, so I'd like to find the theatre. I excuse myself. Georgie stands, and I realise she broke the rules and sat down after all. Today's a day for breaking rules. I have to introduce them, she says, leading the way. Ronnie and I have bonded, and it feels good to know I have a friend on board. I don't know about Georgie. Do you think she's dead? Georgie asks me as we walk to the theatre. The Latina woman? If she crossed a drug cartel, she probably is. Isn't that exactly what we've just done, cross them? No, I say. But it is exactly what we've done. Chapter 12. Let's dance. I'm not sure what I was expecting. A theatre's a theatre, and this is a theatre. Except it's a real theatre. It's huge. Two tiers of seating and boxes. I squeeze past the passengers and arrive at a vacant seat in the middle of the row. Sitting, I wonder why no one is sitting in the middle. The pattern is the same on both sides. The people hogging the ends of the rows. The middles of the rows are awkwardly filling now as they're the only seats left. I ponder the irony of those arriving early so they can leave first spending the same time in here as those arriving late. Maybe they've chosen the edge in case they don't like the show. Or there has to be an emergency evacuation. Your entertainment manager, Georgie Harding. A recorded voice bellows out and the orchestra kicks in. She walks on like a dancer, her knees cutting through a slit in a long black dress. Heels perfectly placed and a smile I've not seen all day. She waits for the applause to drop. So this is where older dancers end up, in management. Aulie's dream was to dance on a big stage. Having counted the rows, then the seats, this must hold over 800 guests. Few will ever come as far as Aulie. If you're born in Syria, where your village is destroyed and your parents are killed, dreams like this certainly don't come true. My message was always work and work to be the best. Because if you're not the best, you're just one of the rest. Aulie will never be ordinary in anything. Her name means neat, perfect, and she is. I hope that isn't just me being a proud dad, but she is the best. Not that I know the first thing about dancing, but I've watched the troops, I've seen talent, and those that go that extra mile are obvious. I guess there was something in her that made me help her 
more than the other orphans who begged at the sides of dusty, destroyed streets. The kids we always shared our rations with. I moved over 50 children out of war zones and found them families in neighbouring countries, but she's the only one I smuggled into the UK. She's the only one who got her dream, a new name, a new future. She's the only one for whom I acquired papers, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It finished my career and emptied my savings. This brown paper parcel might help me forge a proper answer to save some other war victims. And now I'm no longer serving with the military, it could hold the next part of life's rich tapestry. <laughs>